inside the 10 with great penetration. They run the option, pitch it to Tucker. He gets a big boy from Cox. He's in for the touchdown. Boy, Cox just flattened his man, and Tucker... Later this week, your Patriots will be going for their first championship in 30 years, led by star junior quarterback Lawson Hill. Be sure to come out and support the team. Is home for dinner. I'm gonna keep going. start practicing for next year. I won't let you down again. When you're ready to come home, I'll be there waiting for you. at the very beginning of our series that we're kicking off and we're titling it, Are You Missing It? Are You Missing It? That's the question that we're going to be answering this week and all the way through for the next few weeks. And the question is, are you missing it? Do you know what we're talking about? Some of you have been hearing about the invitation and even saw the video and, and maybe you are friends and family that came here because of this, but, but we've, we've put this vague, mysterious idea out to be like, okay, what is the actual topic that we're talking about. Um, and, I, and I hate to break it to you to give you bad news, but we're not going to tell you for another three weeks. No, I'm just messing with you. We wouldn't do that. Uh, but I do have some bad news is we actually already have told you the title and the subject that we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks. It's actually right there in the graphic. So look in between the are you missing it? That's not just this little uh, good little design. Come on, do you see it now? It's G R A. C-E. Now, some of you guys are mad at me, so maybe we should do like a, a message about forgiveness. You're like, how did, how did you put the message and the content right there in the middle? And I literally have been missing it. That's part of what we have been talking about. That's part of what we're going to be discovering and adventuring into for this next few weeks. Sometimes we walk by the very supply in our life. Like we need things. We like, we need them to show up in our lives and they're right there already readily 
available to you, and God's grace is one of them. And I really have no interest in talking to you about a, a, a particular doctrine or redefining and re-explaining what it looks like or what it is and, and doing like a, an academic endeavor into this. Really what I hope for that you get out of this today as well as the next few weeks is that you do something much deeper than just getting information is you have your life changed by interacting with the grace of God. And so as you guys have probably heard, I want to do something a little bit differently is not just explain what's going on, but I want to share a little bit about my adventure over this past year and how I have literally seen God's grace totally differently inside of his word. And I want to show you for the main purpose that as God has changed my heart, I want to show and share that with you so that God's going to change your heart as well. And one of, my, uh, one of my favorite quotes is by a guy named Robert Frost. He says, if there's no tears in the author, there's no tears in the reader. So as a teacher, as a communicator, as a leader, uh, you as well, if you're trying to disseminate information, it's really easy to go from head to head and just transfer data. But really what we're trying to do inside the church and inside the Christian life is not just go from mind stimulation to to mental notes. What we're trying to do is, is go from a heart change that actually looks more like Jesus. So my hope is not to express and explain what grace is. I want to share with you how God's grace has changed my life for the sole endeavor. I'm just going to put my hand out there. I hope that your life changes after this. Because when you experience God's grace, something shifts, something happens. And I mean, let's just, let's just be on the same page. How you see things determines how you interact with them right? I mean, if if you look at your spouse disrespectfully and you see them like that, guess what? That's how you're going to interact. But if you see your spouse as loving and the value that they really are, that's also how you're going to interact. If you see your job just as a paycheck to pick up at the end of the month, guess what? That's exactly what's going to happen. You're just going to clock in and nothing else is going to happen. There will be no satisfaction of a calling underneath there. How you see things determines how you interact. Come on, you with me? And so when we look at this particular idea, what I want to show you is how I saw God's grace differently inside of Scripture that totally moved me to interact with God's grace in my life in a radically different way. And so the first thing I want to show you is just the the interaction between two very popular characters in Scripture, Peter and John. You know about all the disciples, Jesus chose 12 to actually relinquish his message throughout the earth, but he chose two of them to be really close. Everywhere he went, everything that he did, these two guys were normally there, Peter and John. And whenever you look at this, now I want you to look at it from a perspective that Peter and John actually interacted with Jesus very differently. Peter interacted with Jesus differently than John interacted. And the reason is, I believe, down to the core of who they are. Let me show you this. Peter's name, you guys probably know this, but let me just do it for context. It was changed from Cephas to Peter, which means, Jesus actually told him this, which means rock or law. Rock or law. And then John on the other spectrum literally means the one that God has been gracious to or the one that he's bestowed favor upon. Now, if you guys are pregnant and thinking about names, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to go with John, probably not Peter. You know what I mean? That would be a better name to go with because God has shown favor on this particular name and this particular idea. But if you're here and your name is Peter, oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Whenever you look at this, you have to know that, that who they are actually determined how they interacted with Jesus. And, and I know you guys have probably heard us say this a lot, but we don't, listen to this, we don't see things as they are. We don't see things in the proper condition of how they are. We see things how we are. Come on, you catching this? Depending upon the filter and the eyes and the soul and the heart in which I see things, that's how I'm going to interact with them. If I'm having a good day, that determines how I'm going to act and react in this relationship. How how I actually am in the state of my soul will be determined how I see things. And come on, follow me. How you see things determines how you interact. Are you following me? I don't want to lose anybody. Peter and John, two very different characters interacting with Jesus based on who they are. 
Peter, come on, you know him. Who doesn't know Peter? You don't even have to be familiar with church or Jesus or Christianity to know he's the dude that walked on water. Like he's the only one that got out of a boat. I mean, he's the leader. He's the bold one. He's the one that that if you ask all 12 of the disciples to do anything, Peter would be like, I'm in. And Jesus is like, I haven't told you anything yet. Doesn't matter. Come on, you know me. I'm good for it. I am in. He's the first one to jump out of the boat and the only one. But he's also the first and the last to give Jesus advice. You know what I'm saying? Like he had that conversation with Jesus and Peter. And uh, it, was, it was at the time when he says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be killed. But don't worry, I'm going to raise again. Well, he didn't hear all that part. He just heard that Jesus was going to get killed. He just, like Peter does, in his boldness, brought Jesus aside away from the disciples because he needed to correct them, don't do it. Do you remember what happened? It was the last time anybody gave Jesus advice. He said, get behind me, Satan. Come on, you know the story. Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. That has to be a low point for his career. You know what I'm saying? Like, I thought I had it. You know, like I was doing good because he asked a question not two minutes before and guess who got it right? Peter did. But then he just failed the test but because Jesus called him <laughs> Satan. Like this has got to be a low point. And, and that's, that's who Peter is. Can I, just, can I just play my hand here? Peter represents law. He represents you trying to strive and trying to be good enough and always to try to measure up. You never will. You never will. You're always going to come short. You're always going to you're always going to walk on water but then fail. You're always going to get the right answer but always be wrong in the end. Come on somebody, that's what the law does. It thinks that you're in good shape. That's what religion does to us. But on the other hand, you got John John, in his essence, his identity, his name is gracious one, one that has had favor bestowed upon him. And the only time, he actually has a, has a book, it's the Gospel of John, it's the fourth book in the New Testament. And John, every single time he references himself, he says, the one who Jesus loved. I'm, I'm the one, he doesn't call himself by his name, he doesn't brag about his title. I mean, <laughs> I think I would. Like, I'm one of two people that is super duper close to the Son of God. I'm that dude. Come on, who would not do that? John takes the opposite reproach, not prideful at all, super humble, and says, you know what? I'm not even going to put my name out there. I'm just going to put the fact that I know who I am. This is my identity. This is my core. And what is it? That I'm loved by God. You want to know my motive? That's it. You want to know my significance? That's it. Let me just paint the contrast. Peter brags about his love for God. John brags about God's love for him. Which one do you think you want to rest in? Peter, you, come on, you, you just erase Peter's name. Just put our name. This is what we do. This is in the essence of what religion does. If you've ever come into church, if you've ever read the Bible and had this motive, listen, if you've ever heard the idea, your life is in shambles. I mean, it's just not going well for you. You're in a bad season. Your marriage isn't good. Your work situation is bad. You know what you need to do? You need to read the Bible. You need to get your life straight. You need to pray more. You need to get into church. That's religion. Come on, who hasn't heard that? And, and what happens to after that message comes upon us? You want to know what? You're right. I do have a lot to do. I do have a big to-do list. I do need to read the Bible. I do need to get into church. I do, do you hear this? I do need. That's religion. On the other hand, God's grace says you don't need to do any of it to be satisfied because Jesus already has. Oh, man. This is amazing because it's not the fact that you need to read your Bible, you need to come to church, you need to pray because Jesus has already fulfilled that. Therefore, if he has already fulfilled it perfectly, don't even attempt to. But out of the overflow of his goodness and his fulfillment and his satisfying your soul, that's the moment that you change your motive and say, I actually want to get into the Bible. Why? Because it's like a biography about the God who loves me. I'm like, John, <laughs> who are you? Well, not really much of anything, but my God. 
God, he's the significant one. He's the one that actually has breathed life into me. He's the one that gave me a new life. He's the one that gave me purpose. He's the one that took me out of darkness into the light. Come on, somebody. He's the one that actually gives me a destiny worth going after. He's the one that's renewed my mind so I can see properly. It is God's love for me that I'm going to brag about. Because that not that what David says in the Psalms all the time? He says, God, I want you to deal with me according to what? According to your steadfast love. I want you, in, in your anger, I want you to look upon me in your great mercy. Notice what David doesn't say. He doesn't say, God, deal with me according to my goodness according to my warrior skills, according to my position as king. He doesn't say that. Why? Because David is a portrait of Jesus. It's a foreshadowing. And when we see Jesus and the grace that's upon your life, things change. You see things differently. You, you look at God in the fact that he is a good father. If you read this book as, and if you see this book as just a book of law and a book of rules, that's how you're going to interact with this book. As a book just to read through and say, I got a lot to do. There's a whole lot for me to do. But if you look at this book, and no, it's not a, a book about keeping the rules, but it's a book that God wrote to you about you keeping your heart. Because when your heart comes alive, come on somebody, you fully live. And when that happens, you're fully free. Who the sun sets free will be free indeed. Where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom. And when that happens, and the promise of God actually has a place to rest. Oh, man. I, I feel like this, like a year ago, this has been the process of my life. And I'm thinking, unfortunately, whenever you guys go out into the world, some of your, your greatest temptation is to conform to the world. As a pastor whose life is inundated with church things, I conform more to religion. I mean, come on, are you catching this? You guys dabble with evil things and things I don't struggle with, but I struggle with things that you guys don't. I'm around this word. I'm around uh, godly things. I'm around godly people, but that doesn't make it better. Come on, we're still as messed up as you. And if you think you want to work inside the church because there's zero problems, come to my office for a day. I wasn't really supposed to be that funny. The, I was thinking you laugh at other jokes, not that one. But anyway, um, I'm kidding. But when, whenever you look inside, I'm just explaining something and really just kind of confessing that whenever I get into this, there, there is an apt for me to move towards religion and legalism and for you to, to really be conformed to the things of the world. There's a danger both ways. And the only answer is God's grace that comes right in the middle. To realize, I, I just, I can't do this on my own. Exactly. Exactly. And so when, when we peruse through here, we see, I love it, we see this difference between John and, and Peter. And we see the difference between law and grace. And we see the difference between grace and religion. Religion puts the barrier and the burden on you, on man. You need to do this. And grace puts the burden on Jesus and he says, it's finished. From that great story that's declared over your life in victory, from that, go live. Doesn't that, want to, doesn't that motivate you to go do good things? Absolutely. Not for God's grace, from God's grace. Come on, you see the difference? And when we see this, we have to know that, that there's these interactions that play himself out. John and Peter are, are like front row seats to see him, how they interact with God based on who they were. Because, you know, we don't, we don't see things the way they are. We see things the way we are. Let me give you an example. John chapter 13. John 13 is a little glimpse of a conversation that we get better known as um, the Last Supper. I don't know why it's called the Last Supper. I think it was supposed to be the Last Dinner. Isn't supper something you guys say in the South? Somebody told me after second service, it, the reason why it was called the Last Supper is because it was Southern Jerusalem. <laughs> And I said, good one. Um, 
after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in spirit and he said, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you, this changes the atmosphere. One of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain to whom he spoke, one of his disciples in whom Jesus loved. Did you catch that? There he is. One of his cameo appearances. John is in the room and he says it by this. I'm the one who Jesus loved. I mean, I don't know if he did this, but we could just like peruse on through that and not actually catch who's writing this and who's there, who's present. That's John. He only says it like five or six times throughout the whole book of, uh, of John. And here's one of them. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table close to Jesus. Now, this doesn't really do it justice because the, the, the better translation literally in the Greek was, was that John was resting his head on Jesus' chest. Now, the way you and I eat dinner, that would be weird. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you're at the table, you're eating in someone's chest. You're like, you know, it, that's, not, that's not how it happened at all. Let me just give you a, a brief uh, 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 visual. If this is the table, and, and this is where, this is how high, six inches, maybe a foot off the ground, because, you know, Jesus didn't invi- invent uh, the chairs and tables yet. So th- this is it. They'd be cushions all around. They'd be leaning up against these cushions. Their feet would be away from the table. And, and they would all be, you know, just chatting like I see you guys all. And John or whoever would be laying right next to each other because my meal is here, his meal. And you're so close because you, you have all this stuff spread on the table. You're so close. It would be easy for me just to take my head and lean it back on your chest as you eat. You eat with this hand and you just kind of interact. And, and this is literally... As, as the translation says, John is leaning his head. Come on, you get this illustration? He's leaning and resting his head on Jesus. This is a life that we're supposed to live, resting in God's grace. It goes on to say, <clears throat> this is when it gets really good. Verse 24, John 13, if you put that back up there. Verse 24, so Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus to whom he was speaking. So remember, Jesus just pronounced it. All 12 disciples, they're eating the last dinner. And then he said, hey, someone's going to betray me. Peter then in verse 24 motioned to him, uh, who is the one that he's speaking? And then Jesus answered, told the disciple, leaning back against him, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it's the one who I'm dipping the bread. Here's the situation. 12 disciples. Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. I mean, that would be like me, you know, just, just preaching the message. Just to say, oh, man, hang, hang on. I just really feel like God is saying something to me. Okay, I just need to say this to you. Um, something really, really bad is going to happen to one of you. Okay, back to the message. And you're like, what? How, how are you going to do that? Like, who, like in, a, in the midst of hundreds of people, how are you just going to announce that thing and just keep walking? Who, who's going to betray you? <laughs> like, what happens? Like, this is God speaking to a crowd, and you just, you just, you know, throw it out there. Something good, something bad will happen. You know? <laughs> you just, like, what, what, what are you doing, Jesus? Like, come on, speak up. Who, who is it? Like, let's be, let's be real. Now, who do you think is going to speak up to be like, I can get the answer from him? Probably Peter. Why? Because that's his track record. But that's not at all what shakes out. Look at verse 24. Look at verse 24. It says that Peter, the boisterous, loud, bold one, he's the one that says, Simon Peter motioned to him. Who, who's him? It's John. In reference to the one whom Jesus loved, was leaning on his chest. Peter, after he makes the announcement, Peter, he motions to him. There's only two guys in this scene right here. He motions to him to ask who? Jesus, what the answer is. Who is he speaking about? Come on, you checking this? Are you you picking up? This is amazing. Peter, come on, the the bold one, the, the leader, the one that's always there with the answer, you don't have the answer? How are you not showing up at this time? This is prime time. This is game day. You know what I mean? You want to know why? Because the law always brings you short, and it always will. Religion will always sell a bill of goods and only satisfy underneath par. God's grace will always under-promise and over-deliver. Oh, my gosh. I don't know if you caught that. God's grace will under-promise and over deliver. This is our God. This is his grace. 
The three of you clap, but I think it just has to set in. It'll hit you at home. It'll hit you at home. Religion tells you you need to do this. You need to read your Bible. You need to go to church. You need to do this, and you need to increase your activity. And so hopefully some of the promises will come. God's grace is different. He says that God has already delivered the victory and the promises and the blessings and the favor and your identity and your purpose is already there. Therefore, believe it. And from that place of an identity, then you can move through and actually walk that out. That is God's grace. He doesn't give you to work for his promises. They're already yours. They are a yes and amen in Jesus. Not a yes and amen in you. They're not a yes and amen in Ryan. Because if they're based on my works, I don't know that I have any chance of any of them. But I got all of them because I got every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Come on, somebody. That are given to me. And by far that, Ephesians 3.20 says, God's going to give you more than you can ask or imagine. Not according to your work but according to Jesus's. Whose life do you put your faith in? Your own or his? And this is a a beautiful glimpse inside of John 13. And there's an interaction between the two. I'm just gonna confess some things because I just feel like this this is what we need to attach ourselves to, the reality of our lives sometimes, just to be real. If you're gonna ask me to pray for you, I have some days in which I would love to pray for you. Like, I'm going to rip the heavens open. God's going to hear me. I'm going to be promising, you know, just bringing out the truth of God like like I was uh, copy and pasting the Bible. You're going to be like, wow, man, that's awesome. That's powerful. That's good stuff. And that's based on if I read the Bible and do my devotions in the morning and I kill it. Like, if I get up in the morning, I really just get saturated with Jesus, and I have some good, what you guys call, good devotional time. Come on, you know what I'm saying? Good worship time, good time in the morning. And you ask me to pray for you in the afternoon? Absolutely. Count me in. However, if I happen to have a busy day or I'm sick and I don't get into the Word, and then you ask me to pray for you, you want to know how I'm feeling? I mean, you know, I, I mean, I can, but, I mean, Randy would be, you know, he'd be better uh, but I, I mean, I guess I, I can. Actually, man, I haven't read my Bible in a while, and I really haven't even prayed in a long time. I can't remember the last time I went to church, so I'm probably not the best one to pray for you. Come on, you seen the difference? This is, in essence, religion. Like that, that's, how, that's how we do it. But can I tell you the good news of the gospel? It's not based on you. It's based on the God who is faithful. It's based on the God who it doesn't change yesterday, today, or forever more. This is our God who is constant. He is the anchor of your soul. He is the one who renews. He is the one that brings things out of nothing, the things that are. He brings death into life. You don't do that. I don't do that. So no matter if I'm in a valley and I'm in a dark period, I'll pray for you because it's a matter of my God showing up. It's not if I show up. God is consistent. We need to stop banking our maturity on how much I love God and really have a a mark of maturity that brags about God's love for me. <laughs> I'm like, I, don't, I, I think the hardest thing to do is not talk about my love for God. The hardest thing to do is actually receive God's love because nine times out of 10, I just don't feel worthy. That's God's grace. You are worthy. You are good enough. You do have value. You are nice to see. Just the thoughts that go through in God's head are just blowing up. He says, I think about you more than the sands on the sea. Does that that not mess with you? Like here is our God who created everything. What do you mean? He has time for me? He's got more than time for you. He took his son and said, if this isn't a message, I don't know what is. You can't live up to it because the standard is too big, but I'm going to send my son down as a sacrifice just to let you know I love you. Bank your life on his promises and his love, not your own. We need to just break off the religious idea of thinking we need to come into church so that we can push up the activity. We need to see the revelation of God's goodness so that from that, we can actually live our life. And this is exactly what happens. John chapter 1. We just took a glimpse of John 13. Now John chapter 1 actually explains the, the brilliancy of the gospel coming into play Old and New Testament. Moses, you remember Moses? 
Moses was back in the Old Testament. He's the one that brought the law. He's the one that came up to God on Mount Sinai and actually got the Ten Commandments. You remember those? Don't murder, don't steal, honor your father and mother. For the law was given through Moses. I think we're all agreeing with that. Old Testament came from Moses. Moses was a portrait of Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. The law came through Moses, Old Testament. But here it is. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That's just amazing. Come on, just let that sit in. So I know what you're thinking. Well, that's why I love the New Testament better. You know, I just get into the New Testament. Old Testament, yeah, it's old, it's law bound, it's rules, it's sometimes boring. I like the New Testament, it just gets to the point. Guess what? You don't get to choose. It's the same God with the same book, with the same message from the beginning all the way to the end. That God is faithful, he is enough, and he's madly in love with his people, and he's trying to get a relationship back with them. But I love the congruency between the two. Check this out. If law was given from the old through Moses and new was come through, not a doctrine, but Jesus, and grace and law actually work together. You want to know how? You want to see it? Come on, you want to see it? You want to see it? You want to see it? Romans 5. I was waiting for your response. I keep repeating it. Romans chapter 5. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, Come on, somebody. Grace abound all oh, the more. Okay, here, here's what happens. Whenever you get into the Bible, whenever you read the word, have you ever left feeling burdened? This is, this is I'm being honest with you. You just got to be honest with me. Have you ever read here and think there's a lot to do? I, I got a lot of things to clean my life up with. I'm not, I'm not there. I have a, there's a lot for me to do. You ever felt like that? And when you get to that mentality, when you see that, here it is, shines a light. Romans 5, the law came to increase the sin. Where sin increased, what happened? God's supply, his grace, his power, his promise, his kingdom. Come on, somebody. His favor abounds all the more. If you come into church, if you come into his presence, if you read the Bible and you leave burdened, let me just break some bad news to you. You're only experiencing half the gospel. If you think religion is weighty, it is. But God's grace, his, last time I checked, his burden was light. And his yoke is easy. That's my God. And here's an opportunity for us to see that. I mean, you don't have access. Come on, you don't have access to grace until you realize how much you need it. And that's what happens when you get into the law. When you read his word, you think, I can't do that. I can't do that. Love God. Love one another. Honor your father and mother. Come on. I mean, this is so tough. Do you know my mom and dad? You know what I mean? Like, like it just, it increases. Now Romans 5 comes in and it says, where, where sin, the law actually increased. Good news. Grace abounds all the more. So you have access to grace the moment that you realize your need. Because the more depraved you realize you are, the more you also have confidence in that Jesus has done that. He has done that. Isn't that where the conversation between God and, and Paul goes? Second Corinthians chapter 12, and, and Jesus responds back to him, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul's like, well, the only conclusion is I'm gonna brag and boast about my weakness because it shows how much I need God. You know, the reason why we don't have an experience in God's grace in our life is because we are our own gods. And we just handle life. I got this. I don't need you or him, not really others. I mean, we have an independent society. I got this. I mean, come on, I'm strong enough. That guy over there, he was a self-made man. I think I can do that too. And... Every single attempt is an attempt in religion, and it will always, like Peter, it will always have you walking on water for a moment and then fail. But God's grace, listen, will always finish what he has started. He always finishes what he starts. And when you have a glimpse of God's grace and his goodness, you brag, and you even actually put your identity and your foundation in God's love for you. And from that goodness, from that grace, 
from that promise, from his word, in which come back to him fulfilled, you bank your life and you live. From that place of motive, you actually get to the place where you say, God, this is where I want to rest. And, it, and it's that portrait of seeing the law and what God has demanded of your life, seeing how much you don't measure up. That's the access you have of grace. If you think you can do it, this is how much of grace you have. But if you really recognize, I can't do it alone. I can't do this marriage on my own. I can't live this life on my own. I can't work on my own. I can't even wake up without God's help. Then you have access to God's grace. Because it's always been there. Church, it's always been there. But only the ones who actually need it and call on it will experience it. Until God just sits there, knocks on your door, and say, whenever you're ready, I'm here. I'm here. I don't know about you, but I'm, a, I'm like a pretty performance-oriented person. Sometimes I think they call it type A personalities. They see the mountain and they've already conquered it. It's just a matter of getting people to do it and getting up the mountain and actually doing something with it. Come on, who doesn't love a good to-do list being fulfilled? I mean, let's just, where are my people at? You know what I mean? <laughs> Like this, this is the idea that we, get, we, that we get accomplished something. And the problem is, amongst Christianity, is that we don't, we don't take, come on, let's just be realistic. We don't take all of the Bible. We just take a few parts of the Bible and think that I can do that. and I can fulfill that. This is not my specialty, but I can kind of hang out over here. So we don't take all of the Bible and, and put its demands on our life. We only choose some of it to fulfill and to live out. But James 2 says this, if you choose to try to attain this idea and fulfill one part of the law, come on somebody, one part of the law, he says you're going to be accountable for all of it. Let me just release some freedom in your soul right now. You can stop trying. You're going to stop trying. Your work is never going to satisfy you. Your marriage is never going to satisfy you. Your paycheck, the, po- the popularity, the affirmation of other people, those are just man's attempts called religion to try to build you up and to satisfy something. For a moment they will, but they will never satisfy. God's made them that way. They're idols. They're gods. They're just things that are tucked away in which God says, I am the only one that satisfied. And when you, get a, when you get a glimpse of that, your, your marriage will actually come into play in proper perspective. Your work aligns itself. What you do in your future has a purpose. So don't try to do one part of the law because you're going to be accountable to all of it. You want to know the good news? Matthew chapter 5 says this. Jesus was having a conversation about this particular topic with some other people. And he says, listen, we got a lot to fulfill. We have a lot to do. And maybe we, need to, maybe we need to fulfill one part of it. And Jesus says, listen, the Old and the New Testament, I'm not trying to abolish, if you can put Matthew 5 up there, I'm not trying to abolish the law and the prophets. That means get rid of. I'm not trying to take away. I, I need you to read this with me. I have come not to abolish it, but to fulfill it. I came to fulfill that means your, your soul can be satisfied and fulfilled with the very thing that God's called you to do. So you don't have to try anymore. When you get a revelation of God's love for you, you want to know what happens is you naturally, out of the overflow of your heart, love other people. When you get a glimpse of God's grace on your life, you can extend grace to others because we can't give anything that we don't first have. So the issue isn't the operation of my hands. The issue isn't I'm not a nice person. The issue is just at the core that we don't accept God's love and accept God's grace without working a little bit for it. I'm here to tell you, you can't work for it. The good news is you just need to lay that down. You're free to just let God love on you because that's who you are.